Hello, everyone. My name is Sergey Sakalenka. I'm a product manager at Cloud uh, Dataflow. And today with me, I have my colleagues uh, Diego and David, who will be talking to you about advances in streaming analytics. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. Please take some time during the session, after the session, to submit feedback. Uh, and in the session today, we're going to be talking about lots of exciting things, uh, starting with reviewing your options for building streaming processing pipelines in the Google Cloud, then uh, reviewing the recent improvements in Cloud Dataflow and PubSub, uh, diving more specifically into features such as auto-scaling and Python support, SQL support, uh, streaming engine. Uh, we're going to have a demo. Uh, then we're going to review FlexRS, uh, an upcoming new feature that we're launching. And uh, then we have, we'll have Diego from Unity come in and talk about how Unity is using Dataflow. I want to start off with a very simple statistic, 25%. 25% of data by the year of 2025 will be real-time in nature. That's a prediction by uh, a major analyst, IDC. What does it mean that 25% of data will be real-time in nature? It means that it will be the most valuable when it's consumed shortly after it was produced, most valuable to your business. What is driving the growth of uh, real-time data? It's growing much faster than other, type of data, other types of data. Uh, lots of reasons. I'll highlight uh, four important ones. It's the explosion of uh, collection of user actions, such as cl clicks or interactions in games, social media, uh, photos, emails, etc. cetera. Uh, the second uh, source of uh, real-time data is the machine and device data that gets uh, uh, produced on IoT devices, your laptops, your PCs, your mobile phones. And lastly, it's the, ch or the, the next uh, source of data is uh, changes in databases, which are also quite valuable. And lastly, it's the emergence uh, of AI and machine learning and the need of uh, machine learning for real-time data. So when you go to the Google Cloud and you build a real-time streaming processing system, you would typically build something like this. You will start with ingesting events using our global, uh, globally available distributed uh, ingestion service called PubSub. If you prefer Kafka, uh, you also have choices. You can either do self-managed Kafka in GCP, or you can use uh, Confluent Platform as another option of operating Kafka. After you ingested your data, Usually, customers then enrich, aggregate, and detect patterns on it. And they use data flow in streaming mode uh, for this. If you prefer Spark and Flink, you also have options. You can run Dataproc. So when, once you end up with enriched, cleaned up, ready to use data, uh, you typically want to do more advanced analytics on it. For example, machine learning using our Cloud AI platform or you store your events in a data warehouse, such as BigQuery, and, and do further analysis using SQL. Now, every streaming system needs a little bit of uh, batch processing. And so lots of uh, data flow customers are happy to, uh, to realize that they can actually run the same code in streaming and batch mode interchangeably. The only changes between uh, the pipelines typically relate to the data source uh, that you will be using. In streaming mode, it will be a streaming system such as Kafka or PubSub. In batch mode, the, the initial data source will be something like files or databases. Now let's talk about recent improvements in PubSub and uh, Dataflow. And we bucketed them recent as, as three or six months ago, within the last six months. And we bucketed them into three major investment areas. One is improving the cost profile. The other one is improving usability. And the third one is improving security. On the cost side, uh, we launched Streaming Engine and Streaming Auto Scaling in GA. We're going to talk more about them today. Uh, they are now available in seven regions, uh, two European ones, two Asian ones, and three US ones. And our goal is to deploy it everywhere. Um, moving over to usability improvements. Uh, we have really invested into languages such as uh, SQL and Python to allow you to use what you already use for creating streaming pipelines. 
quite a few folks like Python, quite a few folks like SQL, and we wanted them to be able to, to do streaming without needing to go to more uh, advanced, more complex, and also more powerful languages such as Java. So on the SQL side, we, we, a few months ago, we launched Dataflow SQL in preview, and today we'll be announcing new features in it. Uh, on the Python side, we launched uh, Python 3 support. We launched Python uh, streaming support in GA and Python 3 support in GA as well. Uh, and lastly, we created a feature called hotkey detection. This is available in your uh, worker logs. Uh, if we detect a condition that causes your pipeline to slow down, we are now actually informing you there's a hotkey. You can do something about it. And this magically improves the performance of your pipeline. Uh, and lastly, security. Uh, here I will highlight two features, uh, VPC SC and uh, CMAC. CMAC stands for Customer Managed Encryption Keys. And VPC SC stands for v uh, VPC Service Controls. So what do they mean? CMAC allows you to use your own keys to encrypt the state of your pipeline. If you don't use your own keys, you can also be assured that your pipeline state will be encrypted. It just will be Google-managed encryption keys. Everything in, uh, in Google Cloud, and especially in Cloud Dataflow, is, uh, is encrypted once it touches disk. Uh, but with CMAC, you have the additional control that the keys are yours, and you're manage managing them. With VPC SC, what does it do? Well, it allows you to uh, prevent scenarios of uh, data exfiltration. So you can set up a perimeter around your virtual uh, PC, and, uh, and that perimeter will not be violated through your applications. Data will not leave it. So we, have, uh, we ensure that data stays within this perimeter. Now, I mentioned Streaming Engine previously, uh, and it's, important, it's an important feature. We've been working on it uh, for quite a while, and lots of customers are already using it. Um, why is it important? To motivate why it is important, let me actually explain what problem it's trying to solve. So let's talk about traditional distributed data processing frameworks. And you're seeing on the slide a visualization of uh, what traditional distributed frameworks do. They create clusters of processing nodes. Uh, they're typically virtual machines with CPUs and memory. And they also have some sort of uh, network attached state storage associated with these processing nodes. The individual processing nodes communicate with each other, and they also communicate via network with a control plane uh, that is managing them. Now, the traditional architecture works really well until you have pipelines that need to do lots of joining and grouping. Why is that? What happens during joining and grouping in a distributed pipeline? On a single worker, everything runs in memory or maybe touches disks from time to time, uh, but things typically work well. Once you end up with a distributed framework with lots of processing nodes of the same uh, importance and function, you run into issues. The issues come from the fact that your individual VMs store state. And this state typically includes the key value pairs uh, that you're trying to group and join. Well, you can't join them and group them if the keys on the workers are are entirely different. So you actually end up uh, moving everything sort in a sorted fashion to workers that own particular keys. First of all, you have to decide which worker will own a, a key, and then you have to move physically all of the records on that worker. So this process is called shuffling. You're shuffling data around, and it can get very, very involved, especially if your data set grows. Now, and you end up with a state. The, at the end of the shuffling process, you end up with a sorted list uh, on each worker where each worker owns all of the records associated with particular keys. And then you can group and join. Things get even more complex in streaming pipelines because of, uh, of the next issue. The next issue is the, uh, the difference between processing time and your business event time. Let me explain what I mean. So let's, let's imagine you have a stream of uh, transactions, sales transactions. They happen over a period of time. Your customers are buying goods. Uh, each good has a timestamp. So here's an example of a sales record. Uh, time of sales, 10 o'clock, 10.30. 
then there's a, the good that was purchased and the place where it was purchased. Now, this event, this transaction, will enter your steaming pipeline, steaming processing pipeline, not necessarily at 10.30 a.m. when the sale happened. Most frequently, it will enter much later. And in many, many cases, the, the delays could be hours, if not days. Now, usually business users and, and data engineers, uh, they would like to abstract away the processing time. They don't care about the processing time. They really want to do analytics on the business event time. So they end up asking us to build technologies that allow them to run groupings and aggregations on time windows that are related to event time, not the processing time. And to accomplish this, we have to buffer data. We have to buffer data on these uh, persistent disks attached to your workers, and it's a lot of uh, data that needs to get buffered. So in a traditional architecture, you end up with uh, two types of data stored in, uh, in disks on attached to your workers. It's the shuffle data, and it's the time window data. Uh, there's a lot of uh, network communication between uh, each worker. Um, as data sets grow, things get really br uh, brittle. The steaming engine is designed to solve this problem. And it solves the problem by separating compute from state storage. What is compute in this case? Compute is your CPU and memory and some temporary space uh, on that worker just to be able to boot up. Uh, but this compute unit is actually communicating with a distributed database we call the streaming engine. It's a backend service we operate for you. It's a distributed database. Plus, it provides some useful functions such as shuffling. The benefit of this approach is that we're able to much more easily to scale your, your pipelines. We, we use less resources uh, on the worker side, so your user code gets more resources. And we can support this system, this architecture, much better. Uh, this is, the streaming engine is now available in seven regions. And I would encourage you to use it today. Let me also explain how auto-scaling is much better with the streaming engine. I'm comparing two architectural approaches uh, with each other. On the left-hand side, I have the streaming engine architecture. On the right-hand side, I have the traditional architecture. Uh, if you need to scale these pipelines, you end up with, in the traditional uh, case, you end up scaling the entire worker with CPU, memory, and state. And because of this tight coupling, you end up with a lot of inefficiency. On the steaming engine side, though, we can scale resources separately. We can scale compute separately. We can stay, uh, scale state storage separately. And this allows us to be much more reactive to changes in the workload. Here's an example of two pipelines doing the same workload or processing the same workload. Every two hours, there's a spike of data over a period of 30 minutes. Uh, and it's a repeated, uh, repeated process, a very typical workload for, for streaming situations. So what happens in the uh, streaming engine case is that we're going to scale. We're actually going to scale much more efficiently. We don't, we're not going to scale to the maximum workers you allow us to scale. We'll first scale to a reasonable number, and then we, we, we start reviewing what, how is our CPU utilization. Can we extract a little bit more performance out of these workers, or do we need to, to launch more resources? On the traditional architecture side, we'll actually scale pretty, pretty high right away uh, and stay at that, uh, at that number for the duration of the workload. And then when the time comes to scale down, when the workload is done, the streaming engine workload will scale down very, very quickly. And this is good for you as a user, because you're paying for the area under the worker graph. So your bill is directly proportionate to the space under the area of the worker graph. And the smaller the space is, the less you pay. Well, this was an involved introduction of the steaming engine. I know not everyone cares as deeply about the performance of steaming pipelines. Um, and we asked ourselves, uh, do we have to make it so complicated? Can we just make it easy? to every user? Can we make streaming easy? The answer is yes. We, uh, we know that um, users like Python, users like SQL, we've launched very recently lots of good features uh, in the Python and now Python SDK 
including things like live update, uh, the capability to do a drain on your steaming pipeline. Uh, we support auto scaling now with Python uh, steaming SDK. Uh, we support the steaming engine, and we also launch support for Python 3. On the SQL side, uh, as I mentioned before, a couple of months ago or several months ago, we launched the preview of Data for SQL. Uh, today, we are launching several new features. We are allowing you to use, or we give you the ability to use files as your inputs in, into your pipelines. So now you can join a pub sub stream with a set of GCS files. Uh, there are three sources that are currently supported. Uh, it's GCS files, which is new, uh, BigQuery tables, and pub sub topics. Uh, we also released a visual schema editor so that you can define the schemas of data sources. Without schema, there is no SQL capability. We have to know the schema. So uh, now, it's, now it can be done visually. Uh, and you, uh, you have the ability now to store the schema in a cloud data catalog, which is our metadata storage uh, service. At this point, I would like to invite uh, David, who will uh, walk us through a data for SQL example. Thank you, Sergey. Cool. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Sabaradinter. I'm a data analytics specialist at Google Cloud. And uh, for today's demo, I'm going to pretend I'm a data analyst, OK? Uh, and I'm actually, I've, I've been tasked to uh, create some real-time dashboards uh, to actually inform our, um, our uh, regional sales managers. Okay? The data I'm receiving is actually a stream of sales transactions. And basically, when I'm being tasked about that, I need to think, and basically I have two challenges. Okay? So the first one is uh, I only speak SQL. So in terms of uh, interacting with my data, the only lingua franca I use is SQL. So, um, and the second one is actually I'm going to use only one hand for the demo, OK? So can I ask a question to the audience? Can you raise your hand who knows SQL, who will be able to write the SQL statement? OK, good. So that's good. That means that all of you, or majority of you, you will be able to apply that, OK? So basically, what we have here is the technical implementation of that pipeline, right? So we can see that actually we have the first thing is the stream of uh, sales transactions. It come, they come through pops up, through a pops up topic. That's where we're pushing them. Then we have some uh, mapping data uh, sitting in a BigQuery table. That mapping data is actually uh, the relation between the US states with uh, particular sales regions. So I can, when I am aggregating the sales, I can actually report them based on these sales regions uh, rather than actually on the, on the US states. And obviously getting a, an amount and other characteristics that I, I will show now in the demo. The next thing is obviously I need to process the data and joining and calculating some aggregates. Uh, there is the SQL statement, which again, when I'm running through the demo, I will show you this graph a little bit more in detail. The next thing, when I join it, then I want to stream and write this data into a BigQuery table. And ultimately, I want to connect into a, into a real-time dashboard. There are multiple ways of actually connecting with that. And for the demo, I'm actually going to use Google Sheet. OK? So let's go then into demo. Can we switch to demo mode, please? OK, we're here. So basically, we start with a BigQuery UI. As Sergey described it, um, we release um, a public preview um, Dataflow SQL UI. In order to enable that, all I need to do is go into the BQ UI and then go into Query Settings and switch. Rather than using the BigQuery engine, I want to use the Dataflow engine. So I go to here, and I switch. And automatically, you can see that now I'm able to create a Dataflow job based on the SQL statement I'm going to write. So the first thing I need to do is actually go and check wh which sources I'm going to use. As I described it, I have PAPSA for my stream of sales transactions, and I have a table for the mapping <coughs> in BigQuery. So for the actual uh, stream, I can go and see the, the schema for my transactions, which is really good. And again, I'm also quite happy to present that new features as uh, Sergey uh, described it. We can now actually go and edit the, the schema of all, of all transactions. So I can actually go here and change the type, which is really handy when I'm actually exploring the data I'm receiving. Uh, what I can do is then, now that I know the details of my events, I see here this is the event timestamp. So I can actually do the aggregation based on that timestamp. And I'm getting inside the payload a few other things in terms of uh, names, the city, the US state that I'm going to use to join with my mapping data. 
uh, and obviously more important is the amount that I want to aggregate and calculate the total. Okay. So now I'm gonna go and grab my SQL statement because I don't have a very good memory and I don't want to challenge the demo gods. I'm gonna copy paste the query. So I'm gonna paste here. So basically here what we have is a SQL statement, so everybody will understand that. Basically what we're doing is aggregating the events in what we call tumble window. That's kind of SQL standard way to describe what we call in Beam a fixed window. So every five seconds, I will aggregate all the, uh, the total of uh, the amount that I'm receiving from events, and I will emit the results. I want to actually group by sales region, because that's the mapping I'm doing for my uh, regional sales managers. And for that, obviously, I'm joining with the BigQuery table that I mentioned, and obviously for, uh, with the stream of uh, events that are coming from my pub sub topic uh, transactions. Then, like in a normal SQL statement, I have my sum of the amount, and I want to also create the timestamps for my uh, time series, because what I'm doing is streaming that into BigQuery, and I'm actually creating a time series. OK, so what I'm doing is uh, um, time stamping with the tumble start uh, timestamp of each window and the sales region again. So now what I can do is actually trigger the job. Here I decide the region is all by default is fine. I'm going to use some uh, table name that I can remember, stream DSD. OK. And I'm going to create the job. So I'm actually creating the job and submit the job. Because it takes a couple of minutes to spin up the um, analyzes the query, transform into the, the stages in, in data flow, and I spin up the workers, I, have, I can actually go to the job history and see an existing job. Uh, basically, have this one I ran this morning. And I can actually open that in the query editor. Okay, I can first thing see the, the results of the events coming through, already um, streaming into the, into the table, into the target table. And more importantly, before I go into the results, let's have a look into the, the job, the actual uh, data flow job. Okay, that's good. So we can actually go into the details about what is happening behind the scenes, hold that SQL statement, get the uh, got transformed into, the, into BIM stages. We can actually go with another level of detail. We can see here that this is the PubSub uh, source, and this is actually the BigQuery source. Okay, so that's really good. It's giving me, if I need to, I can go into that level of detail. And in this particular case, when I'm streaming, I'm doing a side input with the reference data I'm taking for BigQuery, so I can actually have that data in every single worker to join with the, with my stream of data. That's good. So I have that that view. Now what I want is to connect that to a uh, to spreadsheet, right? To sheet, sorry. So I can go into the actual. I'm gonna switch into this tab on where I'm using the BigQuery engine to query the the data that I'm streaming into uh, that particular table I described. It. And I have here this table. Again, I can see that I ha I'm getting all these uh, calculations there. And actually, I can export that directly into sheets. That's opening for Google Sheet. Good. See my data there. I can switch this. It will come up with another pop up, but that's fine. I can then order, sort in the sending order, and hopefully I should be getting the most up to date aggregated events. That's good. Can start analyzing. Thank you. OK, so that should update every couple of seconds. Let's keep it them running. But you could see that actually I can do that easily and connect from BigQuery into Sheets and then uh, uh, stream my data and see the results from there. OK, so that's good. That actually, um, I probably solved, let's say, 80% of my challenge. Let's imagine then we have that streaming of data working. So we are actually capturing all this data. But all of a sudden, I, come, I get from the sales managers that actually the mapping that it was done, it was wrong. So it was not really mapping properly the US states with the regions. So there are a few managers that are a bit pissed off because they are not getting compensated in the right way. So what I need to do is actually change that mapping, right? So the challenge is for the historical data, for the data that already enriched, uh, I need to backfill that, right? Until now, you, there was no way to actually rerun that data flow job in batch mode using the SQL and then using the UI. 
And again, uh, as uh, Sergi mentioned last night, there is a, a way to actually run batch jobs, which is really, really cool to do this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, jobs. So now me as a data analyst, I can actually solve that more easily. So now the difference here is rather than running a streaming job, I really want to run a batch job, right? And for that, what I'm going to do is, as again Sergi mentioned, we are actually now able to ingest data from uh, object store from GCS. And then what I have there is actually, I can go quickly here and show you the, the contents of this bucket. I have historical transactions there, right? So rather than getting these transactions now through uh, PubSub, I'm going to get them through uh, an object store. So I have a couple of CSV there. So again, in data catalog, I can define a file set that will point into these uh, CSV files. I can actually define a pattern will be asterisk.csv. So I will be able to gather all these files together. And then what is even better is actually I can go now here into the cloud uh, data flow sources, and I can see here that definition. Okay? And again, I have the schema defined there. And again, I can edit that schema. Again, super, super helpful. What I can then do is say, OK, I need to run that same query. You can see there there's, there's slightly differences. So basically, I need to change the, the from. Obviously, it's no longer pops up. Now is the definition I have in data catalog about my file set, my, my, my CSV files. I also need to uh, change, the, sorry, change the timestamp here. So I need to cast from the, from the particular column from the file. That's what defines my timestamp. It's no longer something that comes in the, in the message, in the metadata of the message. Uh, and obviously, it's no longer a payload. It's just columns from the file. So I can actually capture that. OK, again, I want to. Challenge demigods. Uh, okay, that's good. That's always good. Okay, having a, a green tick box is always psychologically good. So I can then submit the job, and then, as you can imagine, this time because the sources are bounded, what I actually trigger is a batch job. Let's see if that's real. If that's correct. Okay, submit that. That's running, and again, I'm gonna go directly to the job I already run because it takes a couple of minutes to spin up the whole thing. And we're not uh, don't want to consume all the time that you waiting. So we have here a job. You could see it's a batch job. OK? Let's click on that one. And then you can see on this one now, again, I can click on the details. I can see that that was uh, the, the input of the mapping table from BigQuery. OK, we can see here. On the other side, we could see that this is the CSV. This was actually. Uh, text, uh, a read text file a source that, again, we use in Beam. And then here we use something different because when we run in batch, uh, Beam is also able to optimize. So in this particular case, rather than using a site uh, join, we're using a, um, a co group by key, okay? which is another way to group uh, and shuffle your data together. So that's what I'm doing. And then ultimately, what I can have a look is on the, on the results. So I can actually Scroll the way down, see which table. OK, that was, that was run into batch DSD3. So again, I can go into BigQuery, in BigQuery engine mode. And I can have a look into this one. And I could see that that was historically recalculated. And it was actually, in theory, if I had to change the mapping, it would actually recalculate the map in the right way. And obviously, on top of that, I will be able to rerun, uh, resume my uh, streaming job, and then it will start from there with the right mapping. So that's a nice way how I will solve that challenge. OK? So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to demo. Again, I think I managed to do the demo with one hand, so I will hand it over to Sergey again. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay. This was our most important announcement for today. You can now develop data flow pipelines with just one hand. Uh, as David motivated the next uh, feature, every streaming system needs a little bit of batch processing. We have the historical data processing, the error correction use case. And so we, today we are launching FlexRS. What is FlexRS? FlexRS is a uh, cheaper, much cheaper way to do batch processing uh, with data flow. Uh, you can run the batch pipelines you, ha you currently have today without code changes in FlexRS mode and get immediately cost savings. How do you accomplish this? Well, you 
you launch it with a new parameter. The new parameter is flex RS goal equals cost optimized. This is all that is required for you to start generating 40% savings on your worker costs. Uh, what is the catch? Uh, there's one uh, important thing you need to remember about flex RS. Flex RS will submit, you're submitting your jobs into a processing queue, uh, and there will be a delay uh, between the time when we accept the job and we actually run the job. So if you have daily jobs or weekly jobs where you can accept a uh, up to six hour delay in the execution of your job, uh, that's a workload you can easily transform and move to FlexRS. Uh, I would suggest using it for large scale batch jobs, for historical onboarding jobs, for anything that has a uh, daily or weekly frequency. Uh, how do we accomplish the cost savings? Well, we pull together multiple types of resources. We pull together regular virtual machi machines. We pull PVMs, preemptible VMs, and uh, other types of uh, resources to give the cost savings. We're also using Dataflow Shuffle, uh, which is our way to store shuffle data in a distributed data store uh, to minimize the effect from preemptions. Your jobs will be, uh, to you, you will not see any, any effect from the preemptions that might happen uh, during the lifetime of a uh, PVM. Uh, we are, we're hiding this from you. And because we're also pooling the resources together, so we have a set of regular VMs and a set of PVMs, your jobs will be able to continue operating using the regular VMs, even in the case when all of the PVMs had to, had to be returned. FlexRS is available in seven regions. It's available in, this, in the same seven regions where Steaming Engine is available and Dataflow Shuffle is available, and we're planning to uh, launch it in further regions uh, down the road. And with this, I would like to invite uh, Diego from uh, Unity to talk more about how Unity is using Dataflow. All right, thank you, Sergey. So hi, guys. I'm, a, I'm Diego. I'm a, an engineer on Unity's data platform team. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we use some of the tools that Sergey and David just showed you to uh, kind of renovate our data platform in Unity. It's let us consolidate our data. Uh, we've been able to bring structure to our unstructured data as it arrived. Um, and we've also, of course, been able to bring our latency way, way down with uh, real-time streaming pipelines. So as Unity's data platform team, our goal is to provide a single source of truth for Unity to discover, consume, and transform data into insights, decisions, and products. That's a pretty straightforward, but probably also pretty broad uh, mission statement for a data team, right? Uh, in case you're not aware, uh, what Unity does is we provide tools for game developers. So our core engine product is used to develop everything from mobile to AAA games. And we also run one of the world's largest mobile ad networks that serves ads in those mobile games. Uh, as a data platform, we support ingest for a bunch of Unity services. So this is things like developers' analytics, um, crash and performance reporting, the Unity asset store, uh, cloud collaborate uh, services, which allow developers to uh, collaborate on cloud-hosted Unity projects, and other real-time event sourcing as well. Now, uh, a huge part of that data set comes from uh, that ad network. Uh, which commands about 45% of the top 1,000 mobile games. Uh, and all in all, this, uh, this event stream adds up to about uh, 25 billion events per day, so modest data, data volume. Uh, as of late, Unity is also making an attempt to push beyond just game development. We're hoping that we can penetrate industries that require any kind of 3D computer-aided design. So naturally, this is things like film and animation. Uh, but also things like uh, architecture, civil engineering, uh, construction, um, oh, automotive. And so as, as the data platform, we expect uh, more data sources to emerge for us and possibly richer data sources therein as well. All right, so this, uh, this goal we had of a single source of truth platform at Unity had some historical motivation in the company. Uh, over the past couple of years, Unity has made several acquisitions. Each of those acquisitions has kind of come with its own data systems and data pipelines. And they were all kind of sitting around the company in effect in sort of in different data silos, right? Um, 
this meant as a data user, data user at Unity, say I'm a business intelligence analyst or a data scientist, I probably need to be familiar with the like, particular idiosyncrasies of the, the systems I'm building right on top of. There's not a good way for me to join against other data silos in the company uh, and potentially extract more value there. Right, The barrier to doing that was really high for us. A lot of the uh, pipelines in the system were also built on daily ETLs. So you can imagine that a failure case here means po uh, potentially days of latency. right? In addition to that, uh, all of this data flying around the organization was pretty much entirely unstructured JSON. So things like schema evolution, uh, schema management, even event validation um, were pretty much non-existent at this time. The final thing, uh, the final problem we had with this was that a lot of these components were built before the introduction of more rigorous privacy laws like GDPR. So uh, compliance was not a first class consideration in these designs. And you can imagine that encrypting everything we have in storage for compliance would just waste all of our resources, right? So uh, the net effect of this situation where we have all of these disparate data systems lying around uh, is that one of the earlier iterations for building a central platform at, for data at Unity had an architecture that looks something like this. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't need to tell you that this, this looks horrible, right? This is uh, horrendously complicated. I personally can't even tell you what most of those components are. And there's really just no way that this thing is consistent or behaves as you would want it to, right? And similarly, the set of technologies in use in that crazy architecture looks like this. Also a total mess, yeah? So uh, we have like all of these workflow managers and processing engines and a ton of different warehousing solutions that came with all of those acquisitions. And as you can imagine, this is a maintenance nightmare. Um, again, as a user of, one of, of some of these systems, uh, the latency for me is going to depend totally on uh, what fell over last night and if the data engineers had time to kick those jobs or whatever. All right, so the, the upshot of this situation is that we, we clearly saw a need to drastically simplify everything about this, right? And as we moved to Google Cloud last year, we had the opportun opportunity to just do that. So now we have selected a much more reasonable set of GCP technologies to meet our needs here. A BigQuery becomes our main warehousing solution. Dataflow is used for both stream and batch, as Sergey mentioned. It's awesome. Uh, we do use the Confluent platform to run our Kafka nodes in this system. Uh, Cloud Composer still helps us with a few auxiliary workflow management things. Uh, our HTTP ingest endpoints are run mostly on GKE. And Cloud Bigtable is in there uh, for some magical uh, runtime loaded configuration for our data flow pipelines, which I, I can explain a bit more later. So as we embarked on this journey to uh, totally rebuild this ingest and simplify everything, uh, we saw the need to focus on these three big goals pretty clearly, right? Consistency, latency, compliance. And this is a, uh, an architecture diagram of the new ingest pipeline that we now run on Google Cloud. Hopefully, this looks a lot more palatable than the last one. Uh, on the left there, we have a few of those HTTP ingest endpoints, which our services post events to. Those applications, uh, which are running on GKE, remember, they then post uh, and forward those events to a few Kafka clusters, which are divided according to, uh, somewhat according to geographical location and partly according to business domain. Uh, the top fork you can see there in the diagram is kind of scoped to the ads and monetization organization, and the bottom there is kind of everything else. So naturally, uh, as part of this ingest pipeline, uh, there's still some organizational division right, that's expressed at ingest time, which is natural. But you can see that all of that quickly goes away uh, when we consolidated data flow. Right? So how do we get all of that unstructured JSON out of Kafka, get it structured, loaded to warehousing, ready to query, uh, all in real time. Dataflow lets us do all of that. It's great. So remember, first goal was consistency. Yeah. Uh, even though all of that data is still unstructured JSON, what we now have in the processing pipe at Dataflow is a requirement for any event that arrives at that processing stage to match an explicit Avro schema. 
Uh, those schemas are stored in a central repository, and they're published as configuration into Bigtable, as I mentioned earlier. And that is loaded into the pipeline at runtime to verify the events. Any events that come in for a particular event type and do not match their specified schema will be routed to a dead letter queue for possible reprocessing later. Um, and thanks to the unified stream and batch processing model in Beam, we can reuse the same core business logic and code for any raw data we need to process, whether that is the real-time event processing from Kafka or any historical data in storage sitting there that needs to be backfilled and onboarded to the new platform, uh, or reprocessing of events from that dead letter queue. So here's an example of uh, a few of the pipelines we actually run. The two on the left there are real-time streaming. You can see the far left, we're reading from one Kafka cluster. And in the middle there, we're reading from three separate Kafka clusters across the world. And the pipeline on the right was a batch uh, backfill historical job, which was pulling raw JSON straight out of GCS from the old platform, onboarding it to the new platform. Uh, so those ingest stages all look different, right? But the great thing is that uh, the main processing blocks in all three of those pipelines are exactly the same. The uh, process messages block uh, contains the exact same business logic for all of those pipelines. And uh, that fork in the pipeline you see is extraction of PII data for compliance, which I will go into a little bit more later. Uh, if for anyone curious, this business logic is written in pure Scala, uh, and it uses a popular library out of Spotify called CO or SHIO. Second goal was latency. So remember that on the old platform, uh, the time until data was available to query could be measured in days. We have now made this leap to real-time stream, and clearly just a m complete paradigm shift for us, right? You can see on the graph on the left there, uh, the data watermark lags for us stays under 10 minutes in that graph. And this graph is actually a little bit old. Uh, when I look at our healthy pipelines today, I typically see a watermark lag below two minutes, which is pretty awesome. The load to BigQuery, however, is still batched at 15-minute intervals, but those are triggered and fired from the same pipeline as well, so we still get Beam and Dataflow's event delivery guarantees all the way through to the BigQuery warehouse. The auto-scaling feature that Sergey talked about, also hugely helpful to us here. As we've onboarded more services this year and as the data volume has kind of organically grown, we've seen a load increase of about 150% and a natural scale up to meet that easily. The other thing about the auto scaling is that it allows us to run uh, in a, like a follow the sun mode, right? So any particular pipeline, its load might have uh, a certain geographic distribution and therefore a time distribution. And the, the Cost saving that we see here is uh, great. It's about 35% compared to the baseline of running like uh, at peak allocation at all hours. And final goal was compliance. And since we were able to build this in from the beginning this time, this actually turned out to be pretty easy. Uh, we just had to write the business logic for it. So the fork in the pipeline that I mentioned earlier, when, a, when an event arrives at that processing block, uh, its fields, some of its fields may be annotated as PII. Those fields will be extracted and encrypted and written to a separate data store with stricter access control. So uh, we're encrypting only the data we need to to ensure you user privacy and we have compliance, right? Cool. So that's our three goals met. Uh, where can we go from here? Well, some of the things that uh, Sergey and David have showed you today uh, are pretty exciting for us. The streaming engine is sounding super cool. We did end up spending a lot of our time this year kind of worrying about optimizing a lot of shuffle behavior with regards to uh, like event destination routing and some hotkeying issues we had to tune around. And hopefully this uh, super cool like uh, decoupled uh, shuffle and storage layer can help us worry a lot less about that sort of thing. The improvement in the auto scaling behavior, obviously also super attractive, it's pretty cool. And I mentioned that we, we have had to do a good amount of historical backfill from the old platform. And uh, even last month, we had yet another acquisition which we might need to backfill data from. So using FluxRS to schedule those batch jobs sounds great to me, yeah? Uh, the customer managed encryption keys. If we can uh, encrypt the entire pipeline state, that uh, allows us to protect PII data and even like really just all the data that's in flight at any time, right? That sounds awesome too. 
And lastly, and perhaps most excitingly, those uh, streaming SQL tools that David just demoed. Uh, as we've kind of solidified this, uh, uh, this ingest pipeline, and it's in a pretty good state now, we're now starting to think about building data discovery and exploration tooling on top of this. And these look perfect for that sort of thing, right? So that's about all I have. Uh, hopefully, if you were uh, thinking about using these technologies in a similar capacity, this was hopefully at least a little bit useful to you. And uh, I'm going to hand it back to Sergey now to close out. Thanks, Diego. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's uh, quickly recap what we saw. Uh, separation of compute and state storage. Hopefully, we're able to show you how, how this concept is allowing you to save costs, get uh, much more responsive auto scaling, and get lots of other goodies. Uh, Python streaming is now in GA, as is Python 3 support. Dataflow SQL is in preview. We launched a bunch of new features uh, today. FlexRS is also generally available. Go and save those batch costs. Uh, and if you would like to improve the, uh, the manageability of your encryption keys, CMAC is a great choice uh, for you. Please don't forget to fill out feedback uh, if you like the session. And if you don't, then uh, I'll see you at the after party. Uh, and thank you so much. <laughs>